people of the internet, my name is Johnny, welcome back to yet another fantastic video, and it is October the 27th, which means two things, <clears throat> but that also means Blumhouse's official Five Nights at Freddy's movie is now out in cinemas and streaming on Peacock, and yesterday I caught a Thursday screening, and that's why last night I put out my spoiler-free review of the film, but now that the movie is officially out, we gotta talk about spoilers, secrets, easter eggs, cameos, all that good stuff, now I don't know why you would click on a spoiler review if you've not seen the film in theaters or on Peacock, but this is your final warning. We're gonna talk about big major spoilers, the ending, the post credit scenes. And now let's just hop right into it. First of all, I wanna give myself a pat on the back because I correctly predicted that old Freddy's security guard would be an opening kill in the film. And quite frankly, it played out exactly as I predicted as well. Ryan Reinecke, who plays the old Freddy security guard, even though I knew he was not gonna make it, I really did feel for him. I wanted him to make it out alive. And honestly, fair play to the guy. He's pretty smart. He's quick thinking he knows how to get out of the scenarios he just doesn't make it out in time and also keen-eyed fans may be able to hear kellen goff the voice actor for funtime freddy and glamrock freddy as the voice of foxy in this scene foxy is always known for his dum 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 song and so actually putting it in the film and having an official voice actor voice that part was awesome to hear. Also, I want to give a massive shout out to the opening credits. It's a small touch, but it's something that fans really appreciate. Having the opening credits give the story of the missing children's incident through this 8-bit minigame, you know, very similar to what we see in the games, was such a smart idea. If you saw my spoiler-free review, you'll know that I really, really was hoping to see some footage of the actual place opening during the day in operation with all the characters singing and maybe even seeing the missing kids get taken into the back room, but I'll take this 8-bit sequence, like I said, it was a neat easter egg for fans. And then we get introduced to Mike, and he's reading the Dream Theory book, which of course is a reference to the popular theory back in like 2015, so that was a subtle nod, I was not expecting it to be like a major plot point for his character. So turning a jab at the community into a major plot point is a pretty Scott Cawthon thing to do, and I think they pulled off the Dream whole aspect of Mike's lore off very, very well. When Mike falls asleep and he gets into these dream sequence scenarios and he's trying so hard to find just the tiniest of details for the answer, who took my brother? Josh Hutcherson is acting his ass off. It gets really, really emotional. And like I said, this is not something we've seen before in the games. This is entirely brand new for the film. And I think for that part of the story, they pulled it off pretty damn good. And also something we predicted entirely correct is that Mike is working as a security guard at at this mall, which also houses a Chica's Magic Rainbow ice cream parlor. He sees this grown man take a child pretty aggressively by the arms leading him through the hall. This is that kid's dad, but Mike mistakes him for a kidnapper. He tackles the father into the water fountain, starts beating the crap out of him. That, of course, gets him fired. We get introduced to Steve Raglan, being played by Matthew Lillard, who, again, love his acting in this film. Especially during that scene where they're talking in his office, and Steve goes to read Mike's name, and it clicks in his head. You can see through Matthew Lillard's acting, he realizes, Oh, that Garrett kid I killed? This is his brother. And then a plan starts to form. He gets desperate. He's like, Mike, okay, your options are limited, but I do have this security job for you. It's at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place. The place was huge in the 80s with the kids. And at first, Mike doesn't accept the job because he's looking after Abby. He can't work the night shifts, so he thinks about it for a little bit. And in this time, we get introduced to Aunt Jane, who is a character I'm very conflicted about, if I'm being honest. I didn't really find the side plot of her wanting custody of Abby all too interesting, really. I think we all got debated when we found out that Mary Stuart Masterson was playing a unnamed female villain. We thought she was going to be like Mrs. Afton or, you know, a partner to William. Turns out we got the wrong female character, though. Yeah, her just wanting custody of Abby, I didn't find that plot all too interesting. It doesn't really go anywhere besides strengthening the bond of Mike and Abby, something that I felt like was already done well enough with her interacting at Freddy's with the ghost kids, you know? But then Mike finally takes the job at Freddy's, and about 20 minutes into the film, we finally enter the pizzeria, which I'd say is a pretty good time. The film is only an hour and 50 minutes long, which in my spoiler-free review, I should have called out because I do really think the film could have added just like 30 more minutes of screen time. But the first night, and you heard that right, first night this film does actually take place, 
five nights at freddy's night one goes exactly as we predicted mike is on a call with steve raglan who gives him the backstory behind freddy's he also watches the vhs tape that kim left he goes looking around the pizzeria he first encounters the animatronics though they don't move at this first night at all then he wakes up the clock strikes six he goes home and that is when we're introduced to cat connor sterling's character of maxine abby's babysitter and it turns out this was not a twist i was expecting but I don't mind it too, too much, actually, now that I think about it. It turns out that Max and her friends are in cahoots with Aunt Jane to get Mike, you know, arrested or in some big trouble. That way, Jane gets custody of Abby. They meet up at Sparky's Diner, which, yes, you heard that right. That is a reference to the classic FNAF 1 hoax, Sparky the dog. We get a quick cameo of Matt Pat from The Game Theorist, who says his iconic line of, that's just a theory. Matt actually has a few lines before his face is shown up on the screen, and in my screening at at least I instantly recognized his voice but it took everyone else around me until they showed his face to realize I audibly gasped and I think people looked around they're like why is this guy freaking out about a, a waiter? And then we move on to night two at Freddy's and this is where things start to get interesting because the ghost kids have realized hey guys there's someone in this pizzeria now. So in the dream sequence, we actually get Mike being attacked by the ghost kid. And it turns out that wasn't just a dream because when he wakes up, he has this giant cut across his arm. And then we get introduced to Vanessa Shelley, who again is a character I'm still kind of mixed on. I think her backstory is a little weird, but we're going to talk about that in a second. Vanessa then introduces Mike to all of the animatronic characters and he realizes, wait, that hook, wait, my arm. And then when Mike leaves after the second night, we get Max and her friends breaking into the place, completely destroying the entire pizzeria. So that way the blame can be put on Mike. He's a terrible person. He cannot at all be trusted to take care of this little girl. Aunt Jane, you get custody now. That's their plan at least. But of course, when they break in, things do not at all go to plan. First up, we get Carl being played by Joseph Poliquin in the kitchen. We've seen this plenty in the trailers. He gets absolutely destroyed by Carl, AKA Mr. Cupcake. So we get Carl the Cupcake killing Carl. Hank sees this. He tries his best to run away. He hides in the supply closet, though unfortunately for him, Bonnie the bunny is already waiting inside of the closet. So Jeff sees Hank get killed in the supply closet. He barricades himself in the office. But as he's watching the cameras, the animatronics are closing in on him. He sees Chica put the cupcake into the vent, which if you forgot, there's a vent that goes into the office. So there's a pretty crazy attack with the cupcake and Jeff in that sequence. And then he finally tries to escape, but ultimately gets killed by Foxy. And actually when Foxy jump scares Jeff, we do get to hear that classic FNAF 1 jump scare sound. I was really hoping we could hear uh, quite a few classic FNAF 1 sounds in this film. I think that's the only time the jump scare sound plays, but there are many, many other FNAF 1 sound effects to catch on your first watch. And also something we've seen plenty of in the trailers is when the spirit possessing Freddy lures Max into the parts and service room, which by the way, has a lot of Easter eggs. Most surprisingly of all is Sparky the God dang dog. That's right, if naming a diner after him wasn't enough, Sparky is now technically an official FNAF character, which is crazy to think about. I'd assume it's just like one of those spare suits. I think if you try to read into the lore of like, wait, now there's another secret animatronic? Like, does Sparky perform on the show stage? Like, what's going on there? If you try to read into it too much, it gets a bit messy. My headcanon is that much like Chuck E. Cheese and Showbiz Pizza Place, every now and then Fazbear Entertainment swaps out one of the characters on stage for another character, but almost definitely this is just a quick little Easter egg and probably has no lore implications, though if it does, that's gonna be pretty crazy. And then we get to Max's kill, which is probably my favorite, almost definitely my favorite kill in the film, just because it actually shows something. Even if it's just a silhouette, a shadow on the wall, it is still absolutely crazy that when the hand grabs Max and lifts her up into Freddy's mouth, Freddy's jar bites down and Max snaps in frickin' half. So we might not have gotten a bite of 87 in this film, but we got some form of bite and honestly, I, I was speechless. My entire theater went completely silent. And then this is where we get a gigantic story dump on Mike as a character. Garrett, Mike's younger brother, was taken when Mike was about 10 or 12, I think he said. And every single night without fail, he takes pills. He looks up at a poster of Nebraska. He listens to nature sounds to calm, calm his mind. And thanks to dream theory, because your mind remembers every single detail, you just have to search for it. He goes back to that same scene where his brother gets taken and he tries so desperately to find the tiniest of clues for who took Garrett. It is very, very emotional. And whenever they're in this dream sequence and Mike is like 
yelling out, Garrett, Garrett, where are you? He encounters the, the dead kids and he's like, please, please tell me. I've just anything you know, please tell me. It really gets to you, man. And then that brings us on to night three. When Abby tags along, there's a little makeshift fort built in the office for her to sleep in while Mike is cleaning up the mess that was made in the dining room. And just like every other night, eventually Mike falls asleep and he encounters the dead kids once again. Where the spirit that possesses Golden Freddy, which... By the way, I'm just gonna say it before I forget, Golden Freddy severely underutilized in this film. In fact, they don't even say his name. When Abby meets up with Golden Freddy later in the film, Abby just goes, Freddy? And the spirit goes, not Freddy. Come on, Abby, it's time to go play. And it's like, what? That's such a weird piece of dialogue. But either way, Golden Freddy severely underutilized, but as they're talking, Mike hears screaming and he wakes up and he checks and Abby's gone. Abby had been lured out to the dining room where it seems like the animatronics are attacking her, but it turns out they were just tickling her. And like I said in my spoiler-free review, this is when Act 2 really starts, and the, the movie just takes such a drastic tonal shift. Because now, instead of having us being afraid of the characters, having them lurk slowly in the darkness, they're in broad daylight, you know, with all the lights on, we can see them moving around a little bit, tickling, playing with Abby, building a giant fort, having a dance party. At one point, Bonnie, like, falls over, Abby runs over, Bonnie, are you okay? And he gives a thumbs up, and it's like, what am I supposed to be feeling right now? Like, I'm supposed to be afraid of these characters, no? But then we get home, we get a bit more story about Abby and Mike, and how Abby actually has made drawings of Garrett being kidnapped. And she's actually been talking with the ghost kids about when they were killed, though she doesn't know who killed them just yet, and of course, that is what Mike needs to find out. And then we move on to night four, where it's Abby and Mike's main goal to talk to the dead kids and find out who killed them. Uh, and then, like I said, they just build a, a fort and have a dance party. But then we follow Mike and Vanessa back into the parts and service room, and you may remember earlier on in the video, I said there were two major Easter eggs in that room, but I only addressed one, because now in this scene of the parts and service room, we get a good look at one of the Springlock suits. And when I tell you, I was completely shocked at who the Springlock suit was, it, it was freaking Ella. Not really a character you'd expect to find in the parts and service room. Not like the Withers or Fredbear or Spring Bonnie. Ella. But this is the scene where we really find out about the Springlock, the Springlock suits, and like I said, remember that Ella Springlock suit, because it's going to be very important, but Vanessa is getting really touchy with that topic, and also about Abby being here. At the end of the night, Vanessa literally screams at Mike, if you bring Abby here again, I will shoot you! But because Mike so desperately needs this job, he no longer has a babysitter for Abby, he starts to realize, maybe I'm not the best person to look after Abby, and that is when we get the crazy plot twist that he plans on giving Abby to Aunt Jane. Abby, of course, doesn't take that well because she does not like Aunt Jane. She does not want to go live with her. So she locks herself in a room. Mike goes out to go to night five of Five Nights at Freddy's. But he once again has his pills. He's got his Nebraska poster, his nature sounds, and he goes into the dream sequence one last time. But instead of screaming out for Garrett, he realizes, wait, wait, Garrett's right here at the picnic table. He shouldn't be here. What is going on? He turns around, he sees the dead kids. Isn't this great, Mike? Look at how happy your family is. You finally have your brother back. You know, you can change the past. This is what your future can be now. You just have to give us Abby. And to my complete shock, he says yes. Very quickly, Mike realizes, oh shoot, what have I done? And he goes to turn around to talk to the dead kids again, but they're gone. And then they start attacking him coming out of nowhere, swiping them with their hooks and their claws, you know, beating him up really, really bad. And when he awakes from the dream sequence, he's in that Freddy Fazbear saw trap being stuffed into a suit. Though, luckily, he manages to escape, unlike the old security guard. In a haste, he's looking around the pizzeria, and he sees, this again blew my mind, the dead bodies of Max, Hank, Carl, Jeff, stuffed inside the animatronic suits, like spare animatronic suits in the parts and service room, once again, theater was completely silent for a film that was so, so tame on the gore, seeing their bloody, mutilated faces. Holy crap, dude. Then we cut back to Aunt Jane at the house, who's just watching TV, but then the camera pans around the corner of the hallway, and Golden Freddy is standing in the house. It seems like Golden Freddy then kills Aunt Jane because that person who was, you know, that lady who was lying on the floor in the living room in the trailers... That was that scene. And then, like I said, Abby, Golden Freddy meet up. They get into the taxi car with Corey X. Kenshin, which, by the way, another fantastic Easter egg. Another moment my theater just erupted into clapping. And then this is where we get another 
juicy bit of backstory, which I'm very, very on the fence about. Because Vanessa finally explains what she actually knows about Freddy's, the dead kids, and William Afton, and we find out that Vanessa is the daughter of William Afton. This was the big thing I was conflicted about with her character. I'm just not really sure how much it adds to the overall story. It seems just to be a twist to have it be a twist. We do see Vanessa in an old photograph with Spring Bonnie holding the plane that Garrett has. Vanessa's then like, yeah, dude, they're gonna convert your sister into one of them. You should probably go stop that. And so Mike goes to go and stop that. Though Vanessa doesn't tag along because I think she was like, D if he's there, implying Spring Bonnie, I don't know what I'm gonna do or something like that and I'm like that is so dumb because I know this is like classic FNAF movie trope someone says I can't go with you it's impossible I can't do it and then they show up at last minute to save the day and then we cut to Abby going into Freddy Fazbear's pizza though things are definitely off the characters aren't on stage one moment but then she looks back and they're all up on the stage they're singing dancing Chica leads Abby into the parts and service room where she looks at the Ella Springlock suit and she's like Chica, I don't like this. Like, this is scary. Mike sneaks into the pizzeria through that vent we see in the trailers, has like a solid snake moment where he's dodging, being seen by Freddy. He whips out a taser, he spills water on the show stage, tases the water, and the animatronics get electrocuted. He finds Abby, electrocutes Chica, they reunite, it's a happy moment, you know. Mike then gets attacked by the cupcake, he yells at Abby to run, but then, in case you've forgotten, Foxy's not been dealt with. So we get Foxy peeking out through the curtain. At first we get the ghost kid peeking out, but then the Foxy animatronic peeks out. That was awesome. And then we get a call back to the Silver Eyes novel where Abby's hiding among the arcade machines. Foxy's, you know, peeking through the arcade machines, trying to find Abby. And then just as I predicted, Vanessa pops out at the last moment to tase Foxy and take him down. And after Mike is done dealing with the cupcake, he stumbles into the dining room. He's, he's yelling, Abby, Abby, where are you? He hears a sound coming from the entrance. You turn and we get probably one of the most badass scenes in this entire film. In the trailers, when we saw Spring Bonnie emerging from the darkness at that pizzeria entrance, I was like, peak cinema, dude, like this scene's gonna go crazy. But I was not ready for how crazy it went. Unfortunately, we are like 10 minutes until the end of the film and this is only when Spring Bonnie shows up, you know, William Afton as Spring Bonnie. But holy crap, was I eating up every single second of those 10 minutes. Matthew's performance as Spring Bonnie was just absolutely fantastic. Seeing the Spring Bonnie suit actually walking around, fighting Mike as well, by the way. Dude, like, freaking roundhouse kicks him. It's crazy. He's got some damn good dialogue, too. He's like, synergy, my friend. First, I've killed your brother, and now I get to kill you. You know that meme that everyone was like, what? Why don't they just like bring a gun to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza? Well, Vanessa did and she freaking used it. She shot her dad. There's some back and forth between like daughter and father. It really wasn't again anything too impactful in my opinion. Though something that definitely was impactful was Bonnie's knife going into Vanessa's body. And I was like, again, theater silent, like no way. They can't kill off Vanessa, right? And it's at this time while all this is going down, Abby realizes, oh, the drawings. I can make a drawing telling the animatronics and the dead kids in the animatronics that this Spring Bonnie guy is the guy that killed them. And now they ought to kill him, huh? Abby takes down the drawing of the kids holding hands with Spring Bonnie, puts up a picture of him wielding a knife with blood, and the animatronics turn on William. And I had my doubts that this was how the movie was gonna end, but we got our Springlock scene. Wasn't expecting the cupcake to trigger it, but we got our Springlock scene nonetheless. I've seen some mixed reactions that it really could have used some blood and blood curdling screams even. I think even the idea that people had that it would be like just a shot of the animatronics looking down as you can hear William screaming out for help and you know in pain and agony. I liked that idea too though what we got I'm not gonna say it was bad though I definitely do wish it was done a bit better because we just get William like Ugh, ah youch. Though him putting on the mask and saying I always come back was peak cinema Though he, he hasn't come back yet, so why he would say I always come back now is a little weird, but fan service has to fan service, and I clapped. I'll admit I clapped. I, I pogged and, and soy jacked and pointed. He said the thing. And then as the pizzeria is crumbling down, the animatronics take aft and they drag him away as he's still twitching, which again, another callback to the Silver Eyes, which was pretty awesome. Thankfully, we get Vanessa taken to the hospital, which was like the second to last scene in the entire movie and was shown in the trailers. I'd assume that she's gonna live because I feel like if she was gonna die, it would have been like a funeral scene or something a bit more conclusive. But then we get the final scene of the film. It's some panning shots around the abandoned, now collapsed pizzeria. 
we zoom in on a back room and we see Spring Bonnie, William Afton, still twitching away. Cut to the doorway and boom. Golden Freddy's dead kid is standing right there just watching him suffer. William, twitching, brings up his hand, but then Golden Freddy's spirit just closes the door. That was awesome, man. Such an awesome final scene. It's gonna be interesting because technically, next time we see him, he should be Springtrap, no? It seems like based on that final scene, there's gonna be another face-off with the dead kids and William, so that is gonna be super, super interesting to see. And it's gonna be interesting to see him in, again, Springtrap form. If they do have Springtrap, I hope they ditch the weird robotic voice that William had when he had the mask on in Spring Bonnie just seemed pretty cliche. I know it probably makes sense with having the characters and the costumes at the pizzeria, but I just thought it was kind of dumb. Then there's a mid credit scene featuring Corey X. Kenshin sleeping in his taxi. Someone enters the taxi, he turns, and it's the freaking balloon boy figure who's been jump scaring this entire film. I guess that's something I forgot to talk about, huh? Yeah, just every now and then throughout the film, a weird looking balloon boy figure, like action figure, figurine, would jump scare, and it it's just, it was just weird. Like, at first, it got me, and I was like, a freaking balloon boy, what is he doing here? But I'm assuming that also is hinting towards uh, the second film being FNAF 2 themed, which I feel like was pretty obvious already, but there you go, balloon boy's probably coming back. Jesus Christ. There are two songs that play throughout the credits. The first one is the Living Tombstones FNAF 1 song, so just some more fan service for fans there. And the second one was a version of the Puppets music box from FNAF 2, which I thought, again, was super interesting. More evidence towards the sequel film taking place in the FNAF 2 restaurant with the FNAF 2 characters. And I'm gonna go a bit more into my thoughts on whether that would be a prequel or a sequel in a future video, going a bit more in depth on my predictions for another film, uh, because we also had a end credit scene, if you wanna call it that. We had the FNAF 2, like, death mini game. Voice lines of someone spelling out C O M, and it's spelt out, come find me. So who is saying that? Who wants who to come find them? That we're also gonna talk about a bit more in depth in a future video. Like I said, I really, really enjoyed it. It seems like other FNAF fans did as well. It's got like an 88% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. Like I said, today is the 27th. It is out now in theaters, out on Peacock. Go, go watch it. Please go support the film. And hopefully, like I said, a bunch more films on the way. But thank you all so much for watching this video and I'll see you all on the flip side. Goodbye.